And that's what it looks like when you paint on a living canvas. We'll be finding out later just how much work goes into making a human work of art. And with that, a very warm welcome to Euromax. Let's see what else we have in today's show. Counting the Queen's swans on the River Thames in England. And Euromax reporter Michael Kruger visits a loud and lively festival in Spain. But first, we go to Austria, to the beautiful Lake Wörthersee. Every summer, it hosts a very colorful event, the World Body Painting Festival. Here, the works of art are worn by humans and created on site. The event attracts artists, models and visitors from all over the world. These works of art are not on canvas, but on bare skin. Artists from around 50 countries meet in Klagenfurt, Austria for the World Body Painting Festival. Ekaterina Mikhailina Milovanova has already won eight first places in body painting in Russia. Here, she is competing in the category Special Effects, where decorations of latex or silicone are also allowed on the body. I like the fact that it goes quickly, that I can bring my ideas to life and combine body painting with props and all sorts of decorations. You have to keep your hands steady and think carefully so the lines are clean and the color, and the whole composition. You have to be able to work with colors. Body painting is an ephemeral art style. Rain is a nightmare. Water washes the colors away. The finished artwork is photographed later. Until that happens, a lot of time can pass. Seven hours. Seven hours, plus all the preparations at home beforehand. The Russian artist and her model have been working together for six years. There's no place for shame in body painting. What's needed is stamina. My legs go to sleep, and when the girls paint my legs from both sides, I have to stand for a long time, and then I start to get fidgety. Sometimes they complain, and then I tell them, wait a minute, I just need to relax a bit. There are six different categories for world champion. Among them, the working techniques of brush and sponge and airbrush. But the competition is only part of the festival. The bright colors, unusual motifs and art installations attract more than 30,000 visitors each year. I take pictures and the colors are fascinating. And so is what the models do. The ideas they come up with are just great. Like that headdress. Fantastic. My daughter is really into art and she does canvas, so I thought this would be very inspirational for her just to see uh, the talent that's brought throughout the world. The, how you can change your body with just pain and all this like prosthetic art is amazing. It's like, I can't believe it. It's so cool. The world's best body painters have been coming to the Austrian festival since 1998. Ekaterina is here for the fifth time and has already competed in several categories. This festival has the most categories. The only problem is getting it all in. This time we had to come from Moscow by car. We usually fly, but I can't carry as much as I want to on the plane. You can't fly with big props. A fantasy creature inspired by the Mayan civilization. This puts her in fifth place. A quick snap for eternity, because in a couple of hours, the colors will all be washed away. Our next report is about a festival of a completely different kind, where there is not only something for the eyes, but above all, something for the ears. Because we are about to visit a jazz festival in Italy's South Tyrol region. Musicians from all over the world perform there, not only in smoky jazz clubs, but also in parks, lakes, in castles and 
factory halls. But the icing on the cake are the spectacular concerts in the mountains. The Italian Dolomites are a perfect natural concert stage. The South Tyrol Jazz Festival is at home here at an altitude of 2,000 metres. The British band Perhaps Contraption performs several times. It's a feast for the ears and for the eyes. It's a special occasion for ensemble founder Christo Squire. It's certainly the most, uh, one of the most magical places we've played. Um, yeah, this beautiful environment and with this, this backdrop. Um, yeah, it's a very, very special concert for us. Um, we've never done anything like it. Shortly before the show, the musicians from London find that playing at these heights is a completely new experience. <laughs> And the venue presents special acoustic conditions too. We'll get some reverb, I think. If Ian uh, aims the horn at the mountains. I've just done a few, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll get some bounce back. We've also got the tinkle of the cows oh, yeah. in the background. They're in the wrong key. We're going to have to lose the cows. Can we lose the cows, please? <laughs> For the audience, the free open-air concert is a real experience. Many are holiday makers who came to go hiking or cycling in the Dolomites. The nearest major town is almost an hour's drive away. The atmosphere is awesome, great. I just find it exciting in an environment like this. It's simply a work of art. The whole thing is indescribable. The location is wonderful, with the backdrop and the musicians are fantastic. Fantastic scenery, the whole environment, South Tyrol is beautiful. The British jazz musicians play in front of three different huts today. They hike between the concert venues. Unforgettable moments and panoramas are guaranteed. I can honestly say it's unlike any performance experience I've done with any band um, in my in my musical career. So it's definitely something that's been ticked off the list. But like I say, would love to do it again sometime. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Experimental sounds, where otherwise only nature is heard. High altitude concerts in northern Italy, an unforgettable experience. Well, the views, um, the uh, the. Uh, passion from the audiences to follow us on this journey, um, the altitude sickness <laughs> with the with the playing, um, and just lots of laughter, lots and lots of laughter. The South Tyrol Jazz Festival Alto Adige and the Dolomites is a musical journey with many highlights. about European lifestyle and culture? Then you've come to the right place. The Euromax YouTube channel. Take the plunge into an underwater restaurant. Try out award-winning and flavored cuisine. Join the race at the Straw Bear Festival. The Euromax YouTube channel. Subscribe now so you don't miss a thing. Anyone who has ever been to the south of England will have noticed the numerous swans on the River Thames. 
Once a year, there's a ceremony to find out just how many of them there are. Swan upping is a custom from the 12th century, when the swans were still a popular delicacy served to royalty. The swans are no longer eaten, of course, and today the ceremony is directed towards conservation of these beautiful birds. These aren't just any swans. They are royal swans. They belong to Queen Elizabeth II, but at least some of them do. Just how many belong to the Queen is determined during swan upping, a tradition that's much loved by many Brits. We just love watching it, the ceremony. We live in Windsor and it's just, we've come out this way to see it happen today. They start at Sunbury, uh, which is further up the Thames, and they come down to Abingdon, which is about 79 miles. So it's, um, it's tough. It's part of the English tradition, but yeah. also it's, it, it's good because it keeps um, tabs on our swans. The tradition of counting swans in the River Thames dates back to the 12th century. Back then, people used to serve them up on high days and holidays, a delicacy that wasn't reserved for the royals. Everyone wanted to own swans. Her Majesty has the right to claim any swan swimming in open waters unmarked in the United Kingdom. The king or the queen gave royal charter to many, many people, and they used to mark them on the beaks. So you had this unique mark on the beak, and that carried on for years and years and years. David Barber has been Her Majesty's official swan marker since 1993. They no longer feature on royal menus, but every year they are counted and expected. The boats and uniforms date back a century. We lift them out of the water, we put a tie round their legs and the adult birds round their wings, we will take them ashore, we will weigh them, we will measure them, and we check them for any injuries. Nowadays, the young swans are only marked for the gills of vintners and dyers. Based on who the bird's parents are, the royal marker David Barber decides who they belong to. Unmarked birds belong to the sovereign. These days, the upholding of the tradition is about conservation. In recent years, Wendy Herman has had to rescue a lot of swans. It ranges from fishing injuries. Dog, att dog attacks is really, really bad at the moment, where people obviously take their dogs, they've got them off a lead, and then the dogs will attack the swans. Um, we have crash landings, we have shootings, people shoot them deliberately. We have so many injuries, people think that it's not busy, but we're busy all year round. To raise awareness about the safety of the swans, David Barber and his team also speak to school children, who are all ears. They even get a chance to stroke the cygnets. If it goes the right way, which we're guiding it the right way into conservation in education, people like that, the public like it, and of course is protecting the swan population on the Thames for the future. If we weren't here, um, we'd have more difficulties. We'd lose a lot more swans. David Barber and his team are finished for today. But next year, they will be back again performing this centuries-old tradition on behalf of their sovereign. A completely different but also very British tradition is to wear fancy hats and you don't even have to be a member of the royal family. Fiona Bennett comes from England, but for many years she has lived and worked as a hat designer in the German capital, Berlin. We met her for our series, Planet Berlin, where we introduce you to people from all around the world who run cafes, shops, studios, and clubs in Berlin. You can find all their stories in our web special. So let's meet a woman who runs a store here, but also makes hats for the rich and famous. Fiona Bennett never feels properly dressed without a hat. She creates exquisite headgear in her Berlin studio. Berlin is always on the go, and that fascinates me. In fact, that's what keeps me here, even though sometimes I dream about living someplace else. 
But if I've been gone a while and come back, I realize so much has already happened here that I really do want to be part of it after all. Fiona has been designing ladies' and men's hats for life's glamorous moments since the late 1980s. Her hat salon in the Central Tiergarten district is her studio and shop in one. She displays her creations like works of art. I have visions in mind of how I can dress up and deck out and improve a person. To see someone out on the streets wearing a model of mine and feeling good, maybe better than before, that's the great enjoyment my work gives me. Classical, whimsical or extravagant, but wearable, that's Fiona Bennett's look. Her current collection is inspired by vintage kimonos. Berliners aren't her only clients. Christina Aguilera also wears Fiona Bennett's creations. So does model Nadia Awaman and Hollywood star Brad Pitt. He discovered her caps when he visited Berlin in 2008. I was lucky enough to have him pick out the Malcolm cap, and he didn't take it off again for years, but ordered more of them in every shape and fabric. Fiona Bennett was born in 1966 in Brighton, England. Her first years in the elegant seaside resort have stayed with her, even after she moved to Berlin with her family at age six. The English are very eccentric, in the best sense of the word. They like to dress up, deck themselves out and party, as I remember. And I think, as a little girl, I took a lot of that in. But then I feel more like a Berliner because I've spent the greater part of my life here. And I think the two cultures are mixed together inside me. As a child, Fiona already knew she wanted to be an artist. She trained as a milliner. In 1992, she started her own studio in downtown Berlin and raised eyebrows with off-the-wall fashion performances. Later, she provided film productions with her hat creations and designed the costumes for the rock group Rammstein's very first tour. I was a single mother. My son was two years old when I opened my first shop, and I didn't really have any other choice. I told myself, OK, I'm going to conquer the world from Berlin. Fiona finds inspiration for her hats and other projects along Potsdamer Straße, not far from her studio. She likes the neighborhood's feel, both tough and smart at the same time. There's stylish apparel, contemporary art, and always something new to be discovered here. Staying alert and curious is fundamental to the artist. My motto is to remain flexible. If you remain flexible, nothing really bad can happen to you. And I think the city of Berlin can teach you to do that. Someday, maybe she'd like to return to her roots and live by the sea again. But until that day comes, Fiona Bennett will remain true to Berlin. City tour on all fours. Gabi, hobby eating. Mew, hobby cuddling. Isa, hobby grumbling. Annika, job leash holder. Together they're the Paw Squad Berlin, the series with Berliner Bite. On Facebook.com slash DW Euromax. Some of Europe's customs and traditions probably seem quite bizarre to outsiders. But the locals are always there with body and soul, just like at the La Patum de Berga festival. This is a yearly celebration of the religious holiday Corpus Christi. 
The inhabitants of a small Catalan town always organize a huge festival which lasts for several days. Euromax reporter Maike Kruger threw herself into the turmoil. When giants dance on the town square and dragons breathe fire, it's time for La Patum in Berga, Catalonia. What have I got myself into? And when the lights go out, the crowd goes crazy and the demons emerge. Berger is a town of around 16,000 residents at the foot of the Pyrenees. Every year around Corpus Christi, the town pulls out all the stops for La Batum, a five-day festival celebrated with mystical and symbolic figures, much as it has been since the Middle Ages. I'm not only here for handshaking with those giants, I'm here to try out everything in the Patum de Berga, uh, even to get under his skirt, if it's possible, and to carry him a bit. But before we think big, we start with smaller things. Soon on the San Pea town square, several thousand people will be standing close together in the midday heat. They'll be celebrating the first of two patoons today, where figures dance around in the midst of the crowd. A group of smaller figures is also on hand. I'd like to join in, so I meet Oscar Guijaro, who's been donning one of the eight costumes for 25 years now. How old is this hat? Oh, um, del mil How old? It's from 1853, so it's 176 years old. That's why we have to treat these heads with respect. They're very important. Only if you live here and you're integrated into the community are you allowed to dance in the festival. So, I won't be allowed to dance at the Patum itself, but Oscar Quixaro lets me try on the hat. It weighs 12 kilos. It's not easy to keep your balance inside it and dance too. What an experience! Okay. It kicks off at noon. Outside, the demons wave their wands around showering sparks. While in the town hall, the dwarfs prepare for their appearance. I throw myself into the midst of the fae. By the way, in 2005, UNESCO added La Patum de Berga to its list of the intangible heritage of mankind. As the sun sets on Berga, the day's second Patum is about to begin. I've decided I want to try out the whirling giant. For 10 years now, Ivan Sanchez Rodriguez has been carrying the over four meter tall costume. Is it possible that I carry him a little bit? Okay. Really? A bit. <laughs> okay, and how? How much? The giant weighs just 93 kilos and has faithfully served for over 150 years now. Can I lift him? I guess you really have to have really strong legs. Oh. <laughs> well, it's moving. <laughs> no. Oh. No, I give up. Okay, Ivan. I wish you luck and have fun this evening and this night. So, bye bye. bye. Gracias. It's certainly going to be a hard night for Ivan Sanchez Rodriguez. The patoon is repeated four times. I look for a spot to watch from a safe distance. The square behind me is even more crowded, and the people are waiting for the show to begin. Uh, and there will be, for example, devils jumping around and spitting fire. So a bit crazy are the people here in Berger. And I guess I would stay here safely. The locals and curious onlookers like me celebrate La Patum until half past three in the morning. But when the fire demons start jumping, the salt, the plants, I'm really glad not to be in the thick of it all.
And that's all we have time for today. But don't forget to follow us on social media. And if you want to enter our draw to win an exclusive wristwatch, then you can find all the details on our website. Glad you could join us. And from the entire Euromax team here in Berlin, take care and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.